Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are joining us from today. Welcome to today's webinar, Continuous Identity, Why Behavioral Biometrics Are Going Mainstream. My name is Peter O'Neill, and I'm the president of Fine Biometrics and Mobile ID World. I am so pleased that we have the two leading behavioral biometrics companies globally with us today. We are seeing strong interest in this area across the board. And what a time for our industry. Biometrics and identity play an important role in so many innovative areas like IoT, robotics, connected living, autonomous vehicles, not to mention payments, fintech, and healthcare. Mobility is at the center of a lot of this. From the Mobile World Congress shows in Barcelona to the leading vertical market conferences like Money 2020 for fintech, HIMSS for healthcare, and ISC West for physical access, identity and biometrics are rapidly growing, both on the show floors and in the sessions. Challenges also arise when industry experiences uh, the kind of rapid growth that is happening to us right now. It is very good to see groups like One World Identity and their No ID conference in just three weeks in Washington, gathering the top global identity experts to discuss identity across all vertical markets. I'll be there discussing physical, mobile, digital, and logical security, all converging together in every enterprise globally. In June, I'll be in Copenhagen at the Money 2020 Europe show, where I'll be moderating the biometric payments panel. And I hope to, see, to meet some of our attendees there. Please reach out and let me know if you are going. I'd be happy to grab a coffee. So much going on. Be sure to stay on top of all this breaking news by visiting Fine Biometrics and our sister site, Mobile ID World. Now in our 15th year, we cover the market like no one else with in-depth articles insights, the largest yearly review of our industry, featured theme months, newsletters, interviews with all the leaders in this space, and of course, our now famous webinar series. And this month, all month long, we've been focusing on continuous identity, why behavioral biometrics are going mainstream. Please note, to ask a question, just type it into the dialog box of the go to control panel on the right side of your screens. And please do this at any time. Don't wait until the end, as this will give us an opportunity to manage your questions, and we'll do our best to answer as many as possible at the end. This webinar will last about 40 minutes in total and will be recorded and available at findbiometrics.com. I would now like to take this opportunity to thank our sponsors for their continuing support, Biocatch, New Data, and a special thanks to Acuity Market Intelligence. And to start off our discussions today, I am so pleased that Maxine Most will be providing our industry overview. Max is the principal of Acuity Market Intelligence and is the top analyst in our industry. I have known Max well for about the last 14 years, and she has accurately predicted every step of this biometric evolution we are seeing right now. Max will be providing us with her latest thinking. I am so pleased to introduce the mighty Maxine Most. Thank you, Peter. And I am so glad to be here with you all uh, this morning, at least this morning my time here in lovely uh, right outside of Boulder, Colorado. What I think is so interesting about the behavioral biometrics market is that it's not really a new market, and yet it's part of this new wave of uh, biometrics, consumer-based biometrics, uh, more expansive enterprise-based biometrics that we're in the midst of right now. And so what I, what I labeled today's presentation is what's old is new again. And, and fundamentally, behavioral biometrics aren't new. Keystroke Dynamics has been around for nearly 20 years, at least 20 years as of, uh, as, of uh, as is a phone or voice-based biometrics, although I, not quite as long as this phone has been around. Um, but these technologies have been an important part of the evolution of the biometrics market. What's interesting now is that the modality is evolving, and it's evolving 
because of new technological capabilities and of course because of new platforms because of the mobile um, mobile biometrics uh, expansion via smartphones, tablets, um, smart uh, wearables, and eventually uh, what's what's happening in the realm of uh, IoT, the Internet of Things. So first, let's start with what's basic. What's the same? What's the same about behavioral biometrics is they're essentially passive biometrics. You have invisible data collection. They don't interrupt the workflow because they're happening in the background. And it provides a unique opportunity in the biometrics realm for continuous authentication, which is something that's really critical, critically important for um, high security applications, but also for the way we interact in the mobile world. Um, so this old category, what's really new about it, as I said, is the old category now includes mobile devices that are capable of generating new forms of uniquely identifiable data that's based on the way we interact with our smart devices, which have all of these new forms of sensors. So essentially, we have gyroscopes, touchscreens, and, and, and accelerometers, and they en enable the development of a unique behavioral biometrical profile, again, based on the way that we interact with our phone, the movement, the or orientation, the grasp, the pressure, all of these factors that are unique to uh, mobile devices. What this has enabled is for this old category to really be reinvigorated and to provide real, what I would call true omni-channel biometric authentication, which allows you to authenticate across multiple channels with, with the online interaction. We've also seen uh, the profound impact of machine learning in terms of how that really enables um, adaptive application intelligence, right? These applications that are being built, that are integrated with behavioral biometrics are getting smarter and smarter at distinguishing between someone's true identity and fra a fraudulent identity or true behavior that we associate with an individual and fraudulent behavior. And then you add to that all the contextual factors that you just get with a mobile device, where you are, um, uh, you know, how you navigate, uh, what network you're logging in on, so on and so forth. So this is really changing the context, if you will, that behavioral biometrics is operating in. Sorry about these slides are coming across a little clunky. So one of the things that, that I think is also very interesting is that the market dynamics have changed. And they've changed because we now basically have a global mobile device platform. We're all walking around with a personal authentication device, which is a biometrically enabled mobile phone or other smart devices on our persons. We've also seen uh, just a rampant increase in cybercrime because of all of the uh, interaction transactions that have moved to uh, the online world, being, which is being driven by this mobile accessibility. And I think something else that's also critically important to the market, and I want to talk about this just for a a minute is this idea that vendors are now offering complete solutions. When I was working with um, behavioral biometrics vendors as far back as 10 or 15 years ago, shortly after I got into the, this industry, they were providing technology. They were saying, oh yes, we have this great technology that can identify people continuously. We can use their voice. We can use the way that they type on a keyboard. The problem was the technology wasn't being delivered in the context of a complete solution. And as Peter mentioned, we have two of the leading players in this field um, on the webinar today. And these are companies that are, have developed solutions to high point of pain problems in specific markets. And that process really is, an, is important in terms of bi biometrics moving forward in the world. It's, you know, the technology's great. You know, I saw an article today that talked about um, a new biometric, which is basically evaluating the way an individual's eye processes a single photon. The technology is fabulous. There's going to be new technologies, technology that's going to emerge, continually emerge, as we move forward in the biometrics realm. But the ability for vendors to understand well-defined user problems and provide a complete offering built around biometrics to solve those problems is something that we're really seeing in behavioral biometrics for the first time. 
So I just want to share some data with you. Acuity spends a lot of time generating data. And um, this, I think, is a really important slide across the board for understanding the, the evolution of biometrics. This is the number of available biometric smartphones in the market. Now, this is done on a quarterly basis, and the last calculation was done in January of this year. So this is basically Q1 2013 through Q4 2016. We're talking about 500 individual models out on the market that incorporate biometrics, that are shipped with biometrics, embedded biometrics. And this is pretty fantastic if you think about the fact that Q3, these are, these are calendar quarters, not financial quarters according to the companies. Q3 2013 was when we saw the introduction of the, um, the first iPhone that incorporated biometrics. So the platform is truly global. According to Acuity's estimates, you can go to the next slide, Peter. We're, we're Max, at Max just, just before you leave this one, I, I just want to remind everybody that, that these are quarters. These are not years. These are quarters. And to see that kind of growth is just absolutely incredible, especially when you look at in 2015, 16. It, it's just, it, it, this chart just blows me away. Yeah, this is really, this is the, this is what you're seeing here is the evolution of a global personal identification or personal, uh, de personal authentication device platform before your eyes. That's why I think this chart's so important. So the next chart basically shows the, the this is installed base and it's the volume of, of smart mobile devices, in this case that includes smartphones, tablets, and wearables. And what you're seeing here is that you know, by, by, by the end of 2018, I really believe all smartphones are going to have some kind of embedded biometrics, whether it's hardware or software. But what you're see, seeing here is the evolution of installed base. And so when you get out to the 20, basically the 2020 time frame, essentially nearly 100% of all smart devices out there have a built-in biometric capability, whether that's software or hardware. Um, the next slide that's coming through slowly, it's like a ghost slide, um, is really looking at the, um, just the, just the um, specifics of the installed base. The previous slide showed you essentially biometric versus non-biometric, and this is just showing you the growth of the actual installed base of smart biometric devices. So we're talking about 5 billion plus devices by, you know, 2021, 20, 20, Um and along with that is the next slide, which is biometric mobile transaction users. Now, this trails the previous um, numbers in terms of devices out there because I'm not really counting in this, in this particular chart using biometrics to log on to your device, right? That's not counted here. This is people that are actually using biometrics to complete transactions, and this could be a uh, proactive use of biometrics. It could be a passive behavioral biometric uh, authentication. So we're talking about, this is the actual number of users, you know, three and a half billion users by 2022. And the transaction volume, I think these numbers are probably conservative. I tend to be a little bit conservative if you look at the previous slide. But these are actually the, 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 the transactions that are conducted that have biometric authentication uh, associated with them. These are both payment transactions and non-payment transactions. Again, this doesn't include logging onto your phone, but it would include accessing your bank account um, or another uh, online account that you have or making a payment. Uh, next slide, Peter. We get there. There we go. <laughs> very slow. Now, these are very preliminary numbers. I'm in the process right now of actually completing a report on behavioral biometrics. And this is looking at the reason why the actual numbers aren't listed on those, on those bars is because I don't have a high level of confidence yet. But what I believe we are going to see is significant advancement in the next several years in behavioral biometrics. And then I think it's just going to take off because the technology makes so much sense. Right now, voice recognition is running about a half a billion a year, and that's the predominant behavioral biometric. I think voice biometrics is going to see some growth, but I don't think it's going to see rampant revenue growth because I think over time you're going to see more deployments, but the costs are going to come down. Or, you know, so what I think we're going to see is just tremendous revenue growth you know, towards the end of this decade, 
and into the next one, where behavioral biometrics are just going to become a mainstream part of the way that we interact uh, in the online world, just because it makes so much sense and it's saving so much money. So I just want to thank you. Uh, I'm so glad to be here, and I look forward to the discussion we're going to have. I hope that this information helped frame, uh, frame today's discussion. And as always, please feel free to reach out to me uh, to visit my website. Uh, Acuity really has two fundamental businesses. One is providing the kind of data in the context of reports um, that you just saw. And also, uh, I do a lot of strategic consulting and, and just love to hear from people and find out what's going on. So if you're doing something interesting and exciting, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Max. And uh, I'd like to now introduce our two other panelists for today. Joining us from the UK, Ryan Wilk, Vice President, Consumer Success at New Data Security. And from Israel, Zohar el Nekave, Solution Specialist at BioCatch, who I think is joining us from South America today. Uh, and welcome all. The first question to our panel, we're going to jump right in because we have a lot of questions that we want to get dealt with. Uh, first question is, so far we have seen massive interest in behavioral biometric solutions from the financial sector. What are the most common use cases for which your technology is being deployed in the fintech space? And Ryan, could I ask you to start us off on this one, please? Oh, sure. Thanks, Peter. So the two most common use cases that, that we're really seeing today are, are human from non-human um, automation detection, as well as human from human authentication confidence scoring. Um, it, when we talk about that first use case, the human from non-human automation detection, it, it's really nothing new in the fintech space. Um, for a bad actor to really profit from their activity, they, they need to do it at scale. But what's changing is really the complexity of the automation and how that automation is working. At the most basic level, we see things like server-side scripting, which is traditionally the low-hanging fruit of, of automation detection. Now bad actors are really becoming significantly more skilled at what they're doing, and we're seeing much more complex types of automation, things like GUI scripting, that, that work to mimic the actual input variables of a human, as well as manipulating the, the web browsers to mimic and replay what would appear to be human, human input at face value. Um, well, it seems like the perfect ploy to, to trick different types of solutions, behavioral biometric analysis can not only beat this type of scripting, but can also detect it with pinpoint accuracy. Um, each time a human inputs into a device, there are key uh, unique variables that, that repeat. But, but any human, we only see those variables repeat with slight differences, slight variations and nuances. Um, automation that tries to trick and, and mimic human input really can't do it with these subtle differences. Um, even when there are many different patterns that, a, that a, a machine might repeat, we see those exact repeating patterns over and over again. Um, because of this, behavioral biometrics can quickly identify these patterns and contain these patterns. To add to this, bad actors are, are really um, uh, looking to, to take advantage of the easiest ways to, uh, to interact with these, these FI endpoints. And, and one of those today is the native app APIs. Um, APIs are, are designed to be scripted. Um, they're built for computer interaction, built really to have the, the app interact with them. Um, this design necessitates they be available for non-human interaction. The problem is hackers have built their own non-human interaction tools. Um, and FIs can't easily detect which scripts are good and which scripts are bad. Um, they have no way to really understand the malicious versus the benign, um, which makes it really difficult for them to, to come to a decision point of, of what they should allow and what they shouldn't. Um, they aren't doing well with this use cases. There's uh, not a lot for them to, to use. Um, that, hence, they're really looking for solutions like NewDetect to be able to help them better understand what's risky automation and what's not risky automation, and what truly is that human, and what's a human being mimicked to try to pretend to be, uh, uh, or what, what's automation mimicking a human interaction. Um, the second use case that we're seeing is human from human uh, behavioral biometric verification. Um, FIs are looking for ways to optimize their user experience while continuing to provide a high level of security. Usernames and passwords, while, while still providing value, are not the strong source of authentication they used to be. Um, with the number of data breaches that are continually happening year after year, um, releasing troves and uh, m much data around username and password combinations, a large percentage of user credentials are out there and are being sold on the dark web, um, you know, fetching anywhere up to uh, $74 per set. 
um, by moving beyond just verifying the username and password is correct and positively identifying the correct human, um, it allows the FIs to, to really move to that next level beyond device, beyond simply uh, uh, data point verification and understanding it's the correct human on the other side of the machine. Ryan, thank you so much. Zohar, can I get your take on this question, please? Sure. Thank you very much, Peter and Maxine. Um, so if we're talking about the most common use cases for which our technology in BioCatch is being deployed in the fintech space, we're talking about two main use cases. One is the account takeover, and the second one is the new account fraud. When I talk about account takeover, this comes in many different flavors, from malware to social engineering to remote access trojans. And the techniques that fraudsters use, obviously, as we all know, change and adopt all the time. And so must the response must be very flexible and dynamic. And one of the ways we at BioCache deals with that is via invisible challenge. Invisible challenge are actually, and uh, we have patents also for that, are actually tests that are invoked into an online session without the user knowledge. However, they provoke subconscious responses that can be used to distinguish a fraudster from a legitimate user. On the other front, on the new account fraud side, this is dealt by understanding really how fraudsters behave. And when I say how fraudsters behave, is on the physiological level and what is common for those fraudsters. And when we talk about that, what is the problem with new account fraud? We do not know the normal user. We do not have any profile for them. And surprisingly enough, fraudsters have um, they have quite differently, they behave quite differently from legitimate users. They tend to show a very strong expertise when it comes to using a computer, using the keyboard. They know very well the application, what we call application fluency. But on the same time, they have very, very low familiarity with the data. What does this mean? That Imagine yourself, you know by heart, obviously, your social security number or ID or phone number, any contact information. When it comes to fraudsters, they do not know this information. They need to take it from somewhere. And this is how, with behavior biometrics in BioCache, we are able to detect them. Thanks, Zohar. Now, beyond financial, what do you see as the next big market for behavioral biometrics? And Zohar, I'm going to ask you to start on this one, please. Sure. So, for sure, the core verticals today are banking and e-commerce for us. But there is a significant interest, and we see it in demand, from the broader financial services vertical. We're talking about the payments industry, insurance, trading, which are, of course, customer-facing. We have end users there. On the other end, we have all the world of enterprise, which the use cases there are more internal, meaning employee facing. This is what we see in the trends. Thank you very much. Max, can I get your take on this question? What's, what's, what do you think the next big market for behavioral biometrics is? Well, one of the things beyond um, what, what uh, Zohar and Ryan have talked about um, in terms of the use cases today and, and what Zohar mentioned about where it's going, I really think there's going to be implications for IoT. That's what I think is going to be most interesting, to see how these kind of uh, behavioral biometrics can be incorporated into the internet of things in terms of where the human touch points are um, relative to the, to the kind of PII that's going to be generated from all of these new um, smart intelligent devices that are out in the world. So that's what I'm pondering these days is what, what's the connection there? Obviously healthcare, um, uh, you know, e-commerce is you know what's happening right now and then e-government too is another space I think that, that you know this is going to be moved into the e-gov space where where you know uh, governments will be using this more to verify citizen identities um, to simplify and and um, expedite uh, government interaction thanks and Ryan is is is, uh, is IOT on your radar what, what do you think the next big market is you know, I think the, the real value of behavioral biometrics is that it's industry agnostic and, and really covers a lot of different use cases, both from risk mitigation to, to providing a more positive user experience. 
um, and, and reducing friction. Uh, New data has seen adoption uh, really across many different industries, whether it be e-commerce, financial, travel, insurance, logistics, gaming, media, really anyone who has an, an environment of users they're looking to better understand, better protect, or, or better mitigate uh, different types of risk that a lot of traditional systems uh, just, just don't uh, mitigate uh, quite as well. Um, and as you mentioned, we, we really see the Internet of Things as being one of the, the, emerging, the emerging markets to keep our eye on. Uh, the, the Internet of Things is creating a, a more digitally driven and digitally connected world. I think what they're estimating over 50 billion smart devices will be in use uh, by, by 2020. Um, this, this level of connectivity is, is really driving a need to better understand who those underlying users are to ensure that uh, transactions are more secure. So really with the combination of, uh, of behavioral biometrics built into many of these devices, it will, it will create a, a stronger and more secure ecosystem across the board. Thanks very much. And then there's my favorite, which is autonomous vehicles. I always keep my eye on that marketplace. There is an industry-wide trend toward multimodality and giving users choice on how they wish to authenticate. Do you see behavioral biometrics as a standalone authentication technology or can it complement other biometric security methods? And Max, can I ask you to start on this one, please? Yeah, I think it's interesting because, you know, I just had a, a, a journalist contact me and he was asking me about, you know, what's the best biometrics to use? And I, I you know, I, this is a question that we've been answering for, you know, 15 years in the industry, which is there is none. And so, now the answer is, well, there's multimodality. And what, what I think is that bi behavioral biometrics operates within a certain context, as do all biometrics. And I think there's places where they're going to be integrated, and there's places where they're going to stand alone as passive authentication. And so, again, I really think it, it goes back to the comment I made about building vendors building solutions. I think we have to look at the individual problem we're trying to solve. And in some cases, there's going to be layered biometric authentication, which will include behavioral. In other cases, the behavioral is just going to operate on its own in the context of solving a specific problem. Well, thanks, Max. And, you know, I'm going to move ahead to the next question because there are a number I want to ask, and I want to make sure we get them in. And the next question is, what are the big malware threats facing us today? And how can behavioral biometrics address them? This is a big topic and one that scares a lot of end users, including myself. Uh, Zohar, can you start on this one, please, for us? Sure. So let me focus on two of the biggest malware threats we see. So one of the first one of the major trends is file less malware. And the second one is the RAT remote administration tool or remote access trojan. Let me focus on the first one. What is file less malware? So basically this malware is designed to hide itself outside the normal file system in parts of the computer not normally scanned, such as the random access memory, RAM, or even the operating system kernel itself. And as a result, you know, unlike its traditional counterparts, malware, file less malware, does not rely on files to run, and then making it virtually impossible to detect using standard means. The second trend that we see is the remote administration tool used to actually uh, provide remote access trojan. This still reminds a weapon of choice for many fraudsters hitting many banks worldwide. Users here are tricked to download commercially available remote desktop tools such as the regular we all use TeamViewer and LogMeIn and to use them as part of a help desk scam under the false claim that the user needs some remote support. So they will actually call you up and make you enter and download it yourself. So actually, uh, this is a combination. Can you use it with or without malware? And to be able to detect those two malwares, uh, or also those uh, scams, this is where exactly behavior biometrics come into play and shows that you know, instead of just doing the, the um, infinite battle race, arm race, that every time the fraudster will, uh, will provide a new malware and the traditional, the traditional uh, uh, companies will try to get an anti-malware, behavioral biometrics completely changes the rules of the game. Why and how does it do it? 
You do it passively and transparently monitoring the system usage and looking at the way the users work and the user, how they interact with the ML portal. So we focus on the how and not exactly where are you coming from, from which place. This thank you very, thank you very much, Zohar. And Ryan, can I ask you uh, about what the you, you think the biggest malware threats facing us? This is a topic that we get asked a lot of questions on. Would appreciate your thoughts on this one. Absolutely. I, I think, as it was mentioned, you know, malware is constantly changing, and it, it really is a, an arms race. Um, there's a lot of different solutions out there that look for specific signatures of malware, but the problem is they always need to be updated. They always need to be modified each time a new malware comes out. Uh, behavioral biometrics really looks to to understand the underlying behavior um, and answer a few questions around a user. Is this user interacting the way they've historically interacted? Are they interacting the way the rest of the users in the environment are interacting? Or is there an an anomaly here that's making this user's behavior stand out? Um, behavioral biometrics really lets you encapsulate that entire underlying user behavior within the environment, both at an individual layer and at an entire population layer. And it really lets you now understand when these types of anomalies are occurring. It, it doesn't require that you know the specific type of map malware anymore, that you know that this is a specific type of Trojan or this is the Trojan's name. All you really need to know is that this is no longer the correct behavior for my human user or for this specific user, and you can very quickly identify and mitigate those types of threats without specifically needing to know every single type of malware out there. So it's really created a uh, kind of a catch-all for malware and a catch-all for uh, unexpected uh, behavioral um, interactions. Thanks very much. Um, uh, over the past few years, data breaches have shown major vulnerabilities in current authentication paradigms. What can behavioral biometrics do to address these large-scale breaches of privacy? And I know that everybody who is attending today, uh, you know, we hear them every week that another major breach has happened. You know, Max, can I ask you to start on this one for us, please? Well, I, I think what's interesting about behavioral biometrics is that they, you know, as uh, Zohar and Ryan are explaining, it really allows you to differentiate between um, authentic behavior of users and fraudulent behavior. It allows you to distinguish between, you know, so you're talking about humans versus bots, essentially, and then it allows you to distinguish among humans. And I think what it does, particularly with the continuous authentication, is that it provides a higher level of security because these organizations can find out in real time that this information is being extracted from their organization instead of after the fact. I think that's what's so critical, is this concept of continuous authentication. And I am certainly not an expert in... in um, uh, information security. But that's really, from my perspective, in terms of looking at the market evolution, where I see a uh, potential, uh, potential powerful tool to um, intercept as opposed to just uh, deconstruct after the fact. Uh, that's very interesting, Max. And, and Ryan, I'm going to ask you to weigh in, but, um, you know, uh, we heard earlier that um, you know uh, enterprise would be uh, uh, one of the, the big vertical markets that would would be good for for all of this technology, and I'm sure every CEO out there is looking at behavioral biometrics and going, "Geez, you know, we're going to have a breach one of these days. I better start to to move quickly." Uh, can I get your take on this question, uh, Ryan? Please. Absolutely. So, so what behavioral biometrics does is it shifts the, 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 the onus of authentication from the data points to the human. Um, we, we think about all these data breaches, and, and they're going for many different things, but, but I think uh, as it, as it uh, pertains to this conversation, they're really going for usernames and passwords. They're going for authentication details. Um, once you can get that username and password and you can type it in and click submit, if it's correct and you're in, that's a major problem. Um, we're placing a lot of onus again on those, those credentials, as opposed to, to really understanding, is it the correct human? Is it the human I want authenticating into my environment? By, by being able to understand who the human is on the other side of the machine, 
how that human interacts and the expected variables of how that human authenticates themselves, it places the power back into the, uh, into the human's hands and back into the business's hands to better understand, is this really my user? And completely devalues the, uh, the authentication details if they're stolen, since no matter how hard someone tries, it's extremely difficult to spoof those, uh, the, the, as I mentioned, to spoof those kind of subconscious input details that a user exhibits, um, even when you have the correct uh, authentication uh, credentials. So really the, the devaluing of the, the, the stolen data by placing a lot more onus on the human is the, uh, is the way that we're going to stop a lot of these uh, breaches and devalue the, 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 the data these bad actors get from the breaches. You know, it's such an important topic these days, uh, uh, Ryan. You know, it, it, we, we've been writing about uh, breaches now for quite a few years, but it just seems to be escalating. And Zohar, can I get your take on this one, please? Sure. So basically, when talking about breaches, I think there are three main points here. As you said correctly, now we must assume that our personal information is out there. So the breach is no longer, if it will happen, it will happen. It's, uh, it's, um, you need to be prepared to make it as short as possible and how to actually to react to that. The second thing, we need to understand that for frauds or for criminals, time is money. And so they know what exact applications to fill out, what information is required, and this is why they behave in certain ways to maximize their, eff their efficiency. And this is exactly the idea behind um, a, a partnership we have between Biocatch and Experian, which is designed to stop criminals from using exactly those stolen credentials from breaches, for example, to apply for a credit. The third point, we also need to stop thinking about cybersecurity in the context of larger walls and stronger, stronger fences and focus rather on building resilience and real-time fraud prevention, which is what we have our biometrics does. Exactly as Ryan mentioned, we, we need to go into the human level. What does it do consciously and subconsciously in order to stop him? Because no matter what mask the fraudster is doing, he will continue to do this automatic things he does, and this is how behavioral biometrics can detect those. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and I'm going to ask one more uh, quick question, and then we're going to move to some of the questions from the, uh, the attendees. How valuable is the data used to identify users via behavioral biometrics? And are there unique best pr privacy practices that must be taken into account with this modality? And, and Zohar, can you start us off on this one, please? Sure. And I think that the main important point is to understand that in, here in bi behavioral biometrics, unlike traditional physical biometrics, the data that is used cannot be used to reverse engineer and, and re-identity. And I will explain. If I'm trying to look at the person's X and Y mouse movement, this will not tell me exactly who they are, as opposed to a look at a photo or fingerprint or voice recording that can be picked up and used to identify a person. So, you know, this is less of a problem for the companies. Now, the real privacy best practices related to behavior biometrics are around the use of the data. And that should follow, obviously, a responsible, responsible use guideline, like all biometrics. There should be clear access control, data retention guidelines, legitimate use protocol, etc. And today's, actually, behavioral biometrics is not really covered any, in any of the definitions in the U.S. However, in the European Union, we see in the General Data Protection Regulation, which was out last year, and in the next year is actually going to uh, uh, to be a must for all the companies. It is actually a good framework as it outlines both responsible use guidelines, anonymization requirements, as well as it provides for legitimate use principle and recognize the difference between using the technologies, uh, but not just behavioral biometrics, for fraud prevention, which is okay and legitimate, legitimate, rather than using this for marketing and advertising, and obviously which will not be permitted. Thank you. And, and Ryan, this is a, an important topic. Can I get your, your opinion here, please? Absolutely. 
Um, so new data has really taken the approach to, to anonymize the data being collected during the behavioral event as much as possible. Um, it's allowed us to offer our, our biometric solution globally without creating any privacy concerns of any major governmental or regulation bodies. So it was mentioned the, in, within the United States, it's a little bit more Wild West when it comes to uh, data collection right now. But within Europe, uh, far more regulation and rules. Um, our, our platform has been, uh, been happily accepted within uh, the, both the United Kingdom and, and mainland Europe. Um, and it, it's really allowed us to, to create that level of comfort uh, across both the InfoSec and, and privacy teams as well as the legal teams of many companies we work with. And having processed over 83 billion behavioral events just last year, um, being able to have all of that data, have the breadth of that data, but having it in such a way that we're not concerned with, 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 uh, with that data becoming a risk and becoming a risk back to, uh, to, to, to the clients that, that we're working with has really created a sense of trust and a, and a sense of uh, calm uh, across the board of, of uh, how the data is being used and how it's being collected. Well, thanks. And now I'm going to uh, move quickly to some uh, questions that we're getting from the uh, the attendees, and 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 some of this has to do with with the topic we're just uh, dealing with right now: the the uh, the uh, social engineering attacks, phishing scams. Um, uh, obviously, by uh, so behavioral biometrics can be used to protect us. The question is, who should be deploying these solutions, and at and and at what kind of scale? And uh, there's a number actually here referencing particularly the, the tax season that we're in right now and uh, with the amount of information that's being transported around there. Um, uh, Ryan, can I ask you to, to start on, on this one from the attendees, please? Ryan, are you there? Okay, uh, Zohar, can you jump in on this one for us, please? Sure, sure, I can take it. Um, so there's actually no single point of who needs to deploy this technology. Why? Because even the smarter, smartest of us are very susceptible to social engineering. Because this is what happens when the information is stolen and it's obtained through phishing and other scams, meaning the fraudster today, they will call you, they will send you an email providing so much information that even uh, uh, the most knowledgeable can fall and will fall in. Um, however, as with all the potential scams, I think that protecting oneself or company uh, involves common sense and an understanding. For example, we just take the IRS in the US it's important to understand how the IRS communicates. It will never call you and threaten you to do a payment right now through untraceable uh, uh, way. So, and this is how many of these scams happen. And when, when talking about who is needs to actually deploy this technology, one interesting example, apart from, as we said, banks and e-commerce, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, one important thing, it can even be used at the ISP level. Sometimes it can be seamlessly detect and prevent rat those remote access trojan or remote administration tools attacks before they even become a problem for the customers. And, and also, an important point, we need to build resilience into the system, banking, health industry, etc. Because a breach of stolen information is just one place, just the beginning of the entire fraud cycle. Well, thank you very much, Zohar. Now, Ryan, are, are you there? Uh, you might be muted, but uh, can I get your take on this one, please? You know what? I, I, I had some sort of uh, issue there for a second. I apologize where everything kind of cut out. I didn't hear the question, and then I, I, the, everything froze. Can you, can you re-ask the question? I apologize. Yeah, yeah it's from the, uh, the attendees. Uh, it actually has to do with sort of tax season that we're in right now and with social engineering attacks, phishing scams. Obviously, uh, uh, behavioral biometrics can be used, but really who should be deploying the solution and at what scale absolutely so it's it it's really the uh, it, it, from from my opinion it's the the tax pr uh, preparers and the the tax systems that, that should really be building out these systems. Um, we, we need, we, we see so often that, uh, that, that people go on, they try to file their taxes, they try to uh, submit their returns, just to find out that, uh, lo and behold, the returns have already been submitted for them. Um, you know, you, 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 I guess we all kind of wish that would happen, but, but not quite in the, the way that it's happening in this case. 
So uh, the, the companies really need a better way to understand, again, is it really the correct human on the other side of that machine, the human I would expect to be submitting that return, to be, to be interacting with that tax information um, with anything, bad actors, they're not just going to do this once. Um, this type of crime really benefits them when they do it at scale. Um, they want to be able to, to submit many different returns, go through many different data sets. So being able to, to not only identify when it's the correct human coming on the correct person you've seen it previously, but identifying when it's the same human doing something over and over again with different data sets, submitting many different returns, interacting with many different data points. So really, it, it puts the onus on the, uh, the, the preparers and the, the, the companies out there that are accepting this data and, and better understanding what data are they accepting and who are they accepting it from. Ryan, thank you uh, very much, and, and thank you all panelists. We have a, a lot of questions, and, and I'm going to suggest to our attendees that reach out to, to BioCatch New Data or Acuity to, 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 uh, to, to get more information about what's happening in this really important uh, area. And I'd like to invite you to join us for our next webinar, May 31st at 11 a.m., The Biometric Baseline Starting the New Conversation in Physical Access Control. And I'd like to again thank our sponsors, New Data and BioCatch, for their continued support, and especially to Max from Acuity Market Intelligence for her expert analysis today. This concludes our webinar. Thank you very much for attending.